Take me to your leader. No, not that guy. <laughs> that British astronaut is wrong about little green men coming to the Earth and visiting us. Aliens have a good chance of existing, and I have said the same thing. So the first uh, British astronaut in space, her name was Helen Sharman. She recently made the news, and many of you sent this article to me, and she said that there is a definite chance that aliens exist, but she went on to say they might even be among us, but we can't see them. Now, I have said that aliens probably exist for a long time, but I need, especially for this news story, I need to make the separation very clear. How many stars are in the universe? Well, the estimates based on the number of galaxies and how many uh, stars on average each of these galaxies has is 10,000 billion trillion. 10, uh, one with 25 zeros. That is an astronomically, literally, large number. It is almost hard, you can't really even comprehend it. That's so many stars. How many of those stars have planets? Well, our estimates say that each star in the universe, on average, might have a number of planets, which pushes the, uh, the num, oh, sorry. <laughs> I had this backwards, okay. So this is the possible total number of planets around all the stars because the number of stars in the universe is around 10 to the 21. And if we think that each star has a couple of planets, uh, you know, tens, dozens, hundreds, whatever, uh, in solar systems across the universe, add that all up, you get around 10 to the 25 planets in its life, planets in the universe total. Now that is so big that even if the chances of alien life existing is vanishingly small, it is still a pretty good chance. So let's just say we can do some simple math with this. So if you want to subtract huge numbers like with exponents like this, you can basically just subtract the exponent. So let's say that the chances of finding life somewhere else, say another solar system, is one in a billion. Or let's consider one in a trillion, something like that. Now we can just subtract the exponents here. And I think if your rudimentary algebra doesn't fail you, you can see that even if you subtract a billion from this 10 to 25, you still have a hundred trillion left over. Now the chances of alien life existing. So if you say one planet might have a one in a trillion chance of having alien life on it, Based on the number of planets, that still means that trillions of planets, think about that, trillions of planets in the universe have some form of life on it. Because these numbers are so big, even if the chances of life are so, so small, there's a good chance there's at least some other life out there in the universe. That's always been my position. It is very likely that we are not the only things in the universe. Where you must make the delineation, though, is with the same number reasoning. Have aliens ever been to Earth? Have they ever visited us? Is there any validity to UFO sightings linked to aliens, to Roswell, to conspiracy theories, that kind of thing? Well, probably not. And so probably that it's probably not even worth thinking about all that much. And again, that's because of the numbers. We are one. One out of this many planets. One with 25 zeros after it. What are the chances that some extraterrestrial life exists and then had a civilization and then got advanced enough to master interstellar travel and then found us across the vastness of space while our transmissions moving at the speed of light, like our, our, our radio signals, for example, have only expanded in a bubble around our planet for 200 light years in every direction. The chances are so, so small in the face of these numbers, in opposition to the numbers like these, that we need really, really good evidence to suggest that aliens might be living among us. So while we have some good statistical reasoning why there might be life out there in the universe, the same statistical reasoning says extraordinary claims, like from uh, Ms. Sharman, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan once said. So aliens, yes, they probably exist. Have they been here? We have not seen any good evidence to suggest that they do. Hello, and welcome to Because Science Live. I think the only live science show on YouTube. 
<laughs> My name is Kyle Hill. I look. I'm a generalist. I'm not a working scientist. I'm not. Uh, I don't have a PhD, but I do know a lot about. Eh, this, that, and the other sciencey things. So if you have any pop culture, any sciencey questions that you think I might be able to answer off the top of my head, woo, it's live. I'll try to be as smart as I can. Put it in the YouTube chat and Voice of the Void Nate will read out the best questions. Please don't spam the chat or else I will never ever answer you. And Happy New Year! We're back. And I have a, I've been hibernating. You can, you can see. What's up, Nate? What's up, Kyle? Oh, New Year, new, new, new beard. New beard. People are complimenting the beard. By hey, the way. thank you. I need constant affirmation of every aspect of me. Because I'm a millennial. No, it's too easy. It's easy humor. From Sam Average Man. Howdy, Kyle. Hey. Could two Earths, whoa, could two Earth like planets, planets exist in a binary orbit and still support human life? Or would the system be too unsta unstable? Hmm, so I think what you're describing is a very weird situation, and I'm gonna redirect it at the end, but I think what you're describing is something like this. None of this is to scale, nerds, so don't say that. So if we have a sun here, I think what you're describing is two Earths, or pseudo-Earths, in an orbit, a binary orbit, around each other, and they in total are going around their star. Now, I don't, I've never heard of anything like this. I would imagine that because, hmm, the center of, the center of mass for this system here, because on average, the stars in solar systems are so, so, so much larger than the planets. Uh, the sun in terms of volume is I think a million times uh, more voluminous than the Earth. A million Earths can fit inside of it. So 99% of the mass uh, of a system is inside of the star. So why would these planets orbit each other? If the center of mass is basically in the center of this star here, then they would not be compelled to orbit around a common center of gravity like this. I don't think, and then they would be more or less pulled into this, well, they'd both be pulled into an orbit around the star, but not into an orbit around each other like this. Now, I'm not an astronomer. There might be situations like this, and you could think of a system like the Earth and the Moon, or Earth and satellites and stuff like that, um, but in those cases, again, you have one much, much larger mass orbiting around a much, much uh, smaller mass, relatively speaking. So if you have two relatively equal sized objects, I do not know if they can orbit each other around a star. Again, not an expert, but I don't think, I'm not sure if that's ever happened. If it does, I've never heard of it. So I, I don't know if that really answers your question. However, I will say, uh, to redirect your question a little bit, the majority of the stars, that you see in the night sky when you look up, oh, it's beautiful. The majority of those stars that you see are in fact multiple star systems. Relatively speaking, our sun is kind of unique in that it is uh, part of just a single star system. So when you look up in the night sky, in contrast to this here, most of the stars are in fact binary or tertiary or quaternary star systems and they are orbiting each other like this around a common center of mass, which I forget the name of it. Anyway, so <laughs> I know what that, I, I think I know what that is. So when you have a binary star system like this, now you have this giant amount of mass and they're orbiting a common center of mass here. So the center of mass of the entire solar system around it is in that point because most of the mass is right there. You can, and we know this for sure, you can have planets, even habitable planets, that would be orbiting this binary system. So these stars are orbiting each other, and then you have a planet like Earth orbiting the entire system in a circumbinary orbit, it's called. This means that a planet like Tatooine is not just possible, it's highly likely. If you're on a desert planet, you're probably, you, you, uh, you have a good chance of being, well, doesn't depend on being a desert planet, but if you're on a planet in a solar system, there's a good chance that you're in a binary, star, star, uh, a binary star system. 
or one with more stars, it's live, and uh, then tattooing would be possible. And then you could look off into the distance and then you could uh, hum the John Williams theme, which I can't on stream. Or else John Williams personally comes to your house and hits you in the knee with a bat. It's true. I don't know if you guys know that. He's I've, very I've, litigious. I've seen it happen. Yeah, he hates cartilage. From Attila E. I was wondering that if you could go anywhere on our solar system. Hey, in the chat, sorry. If I'm wrong about this, let me know. Because I like to correct my, my own knowledge. I can't just be out here being wrong. What am I? Alex Jones? No. That's an Infowars slam. Yeah. Because he's a terrible person. If you can go anywhere on our solar system, where would you go? Hmm. If I could go anywhere in the solar system without dying, which you would in pretty much everywhere without a suit. Um, if I was invulnerable to the climate, I would want to perhaps make my way through the dense, uh, dense gas of Jupiter or Saturn, or sit in the eye of the great red spot and see how it looks. I don't know why I'm doing that voice. Or I would go to a place where it's very likely that we could find life. I would want to be the first one. If I had an opportunity to, and if, if I was qualified, I would love to make history such that, you know, uh, be, uh, be witness to the expedition that finds life on Europa or Titan in, in, the, in, in the subsurface oceans or something like that. Um, I would like to go to any place where it's likely to find life, because that would be the most important discovery ever, ever. Aside, yeah, I mean, the... We keep coming back to this. But they haven't been here, despite what Alex Shout says. From Leet Hacker. Dude sucks. What? From Leet Hacker. No, I know. I was just trying to be funny. All right. Do you have any recommendations for books and the like on nerdy science? Someone, one of you super nerds, I got sent this over the break, uh, created and shared, I think it's on uh, my Reddit, a Google Doc of every single book I've ever recommended on the show. And we might be able to find that and put that in the chat. But uh, So I've recommended not very many books, like 10 <laughs> uh, since I've been doing this show. But if I had to recommend uh, a nerdy book, it, this, this book is uh, kind of dry, but it is incredibly well written. It covers, well, the title will give it away. It's called A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. And I've mentioned it a number of times because it is a fantastic entry point. It gives a brief history of nearly, ev short or brief? It's one of the two. A brief history of nearly everything from the start of the universe to the end of it, going through biology, evolution, uh, the, and he uses fantastical, it, it makes me, it makes me uh, jealous as a science communicator because he uses these wonderful metaphors and these awesome numbers to paint the scale and the scope of our universe and life and biology and all that. Um, so Bill Bryson, Short History Near Really Everything, I would highly recommend. And not only does he go through the science of stuff, he talks about the human beings who um, discovered and worked on all these things and what their lives were like and what they were like as people and how interpersonal arguing shaped science as we know it. Like how, uh, how like uh, decades long arguments about how dinosaurs should be classified led to modern ideas about what dinosaurs are. So uh, that's a really good book. I would recommend that one as a good uh, starting point for that, that covers a breadth of topics. Speaking of dinosaurs, Woo! from AW. Hello. Hey, Kyle, love the show and the hair. Hey, thank you once, twice, three times, your question. Have humans had a bigger environmental impact than the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs? Ooh, interesting question. Well, hmm. 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 See, I, I'm thinking about this so much because when I think about, so I, I'll bring you into my thought process. So what would determine, uh, we remember the dinosaur extinction because it made such a grand change to the environment, to the biota, uh, the flora and fauna, everything. And so you, you think about it in that scope and scale, like mass extinction, it laid down a marker that you can find in the fossil record, the KT line, I believe it's called, where you can find, I think it's a line of iridium sediment laid down across the planet. And this is just from vaporized asteroid just spreading itself across the planet. You can find the KT boundary, I think it's called, in the fossil record. So you can actually see the event happen in the geological record. So this is a massive impact. So you think about, affecting the world that much, and then you're like, well, humans couldn't do anything on that scope and scale, eh, but think about it. 
Right now, a number of scientists are pushing the idea of the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene, if you want to uh, look it up. And it's the idea that there's a new era in the history of Earth started by humans and their radical re-engineering of the planet, the climate, the biology, and everything. So let's go back. What has the Anthropocene done? Has it caused a massive uh, extinction event? Uh, yeah, many biologists classify uh, this as the next great extinction event. Because of climate change, because of how much humans are affecting the Earth, I, what is it, like one species a day, one species an hour is on average considered extinct because of human activity? We are causing the next great extinction event. Okay, starting to sound pretty bad. Well, are we affecting the Earth so much that we could find it in the record like a thousand years from now? Yeah, we have put down so many materials like, um, say, plastics that will uh, linger around in, in history for so long they will not naturally degrade that a thousand years from now you could dig down and find a layer of when plastics started. Or, uh, better yet, uh, one way that scientists want to define the start of the Anthropocene is by looking for the start of atomic testing. So you can look into rocks and, and materials and try to find the isotopes that aren't naturally found that are produced as uh, the resultant that are produced as the resultant of um, nuclear explosions. So that's one way to look for it. It's around the 1950s, right? 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. So humans are causing the next great extinction event, altering the Earth enough to be found in the fossil record probably millions of years from now. Are we affecting Earth as much as the asteroid did? I, off the top of my head, I, I, can't, I can't say yes or no because, again, I'm not an expert, but I would say there's a pretty decent argument that we're, that th there's, a, there's a decent argument. That's not a silly question. And that, that that's not a silly question, I think should worry you about how much we're changing the Earth. It worries me. That's all I do. From Java Monk. I uh, didn't like that time delay, Nate. I was let, letting it simmer. Thank you. How like hard a, like would Charlie Brown you. have to attempt to kick the ball <laughs> for him to go flying into the air like he does? Is it hard enough to kick the ball to the moon? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. So, silly question. So, what you're, what you're talking about is the class, for any of you younger viewers, uh, what are... What our commenter is asking about is a very old person cartoon called <laughs> called Charlie Brown. Uh, you're probably not that old. You're probably right. It's Peanuts cartoon. Peanuts. Yeah. See, I don't even know the name. Uh, very old Charlie Brown cartoon, where uh, Charlie Brown is trying to kick a football and dark haired blue dress character holds the football and then pulls the football out from when Charlie Brown is running at it and he kicks and he kicks so hard that he flings himself up into the air like five feet or something like that. Um, how hard would you have to kick your leg to fling yourself up into the air? Um, I've seen gymnasts do what's called a gainer where you kick your leg out in front of you and use the momentum from your leg to flip yourself around. I've seen rock climbers uh, make dynamic jumps and moves by using their leg as a sort of pendulum and moving with it and then going and jumping. So I don't think you have to kick your leg all that hard to encourage your body to f move off of the ground some appreciable amount. I don't know how hard you'd have to do it to fling yourself totally into the air, although I will say it is definitely not to, it's definitely not enough to kick a football to the moon. No, you can't kick a football to the moon. I, I doubt that even the best kicker in the world could kick a football more than like 200 feet up. Not high enough. You're talking like 100 kilometers. We can't fire, you can't fire a gun to space. You don't have that kind of energy in your leg. Come on, come on. I'm like Pigpen, by the way, because cat hair is constantly flying out from my body. From Tim Nim Anderson. Do, do, do. Could we create a controlled tsunami to gently flood the lands and keep all the plants and trees wet to help mitigate the wildfires? You want to put out Australia with the ocean? 
I don't, I think creating a man-made, first part of the question, can you create a man-made tsunami? Yeah, probably. All you'd have to find is, uh, let's go to a very large cliff face uh, or the side of a glacier or something like that and strategically place explosives to create a giant landslide, you know, millions of tons of material. And landslides, we know landslides can cause massive tsunami-like waves that, you know, 100-foot tall waves that can wipe out stuff. So I don't think that'd be too hard. You just have to find the right location, the right environment. Would you want to put out the wildfires somewhere, like on the coast of California or Australia with seawater? No, because I'm... Wouldn't you just poison the earth with salt? Wouldn't there be so much salt that nothing could grow after that? I think you'd be replacing one disaster with another. I don't know. I, I might be wrong on this. Like, uh, there, there's, there are probably reports of, say, in Japan or the Indonesian uh, earthquake and tsunami. I, I don't know what happens exactly to the soil and the ground after all of those seawaters recede. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that topsoil is eroded away and there's a lot of uh, residue left over from the salt, which would make it probably worse than it was. And I don't know if it's worse than the wildfires would be. So my guess is don't create a disaster to solve another disaster. That's how you end up with invasive species. From Rob Cunningham. Not the tsunami part, but like introducing like a snake to kill like the mice and then the snakes go crazy and they have to introduce like a cat and whatever. From Rob Cunningham. Yes. I'm an engineering teacher at a high school in Northern California. Fantastic. And I was hoping that you could recommend a project or a build for my class. Also, please come guest lecture sometime. Where are you at? Where's he at? Northern California. Done. Rob, if you're watching right now, Rob. Yeah. Rob, if you're watching right now, you can find my email on the internet. Send me an email. We'll, do, we'll make a thing of it. Um, a project for engineering class. High school. Okay, okay, okay. So I didn't take, I, I have a degree in engineering, but I didn't take any engineering in high school. I took uh, mostly physics and stuff like that, general uh, science topics. So hard to say, because I don't really have my head on straight to know what is exactly uh, high school level. Um, can never go wrong with an egg drop. That's one thing. Uh, but another thing, one thing, one thing I, I always had problems with in school was for whatever reason, it was hard for me to wrap my heads around circuits and circuitry. But um, what was really powerful is creating something and actually seeing it work. So I would, I would recommend maybe looking into some beginning um, beginning builds with like Arduino boards and things like that to create, uh, you know, switches and uh, on and off switches and lights and relays and that kind of thing to show the students specifically that things that they do can have actionable effects in the real world. Um, another thing that was fun, I remember um, using engineering principles with something like a bridge and uh, if you can find or source a shaker table, uh, we had a competition in school to see who could build the most structurally stable bridge out of, uh, was it, it was tongue depressors or toothpicks or something like that. But we had to use our, what we were going through in school to glue together a rudimentary bridge and then put it on a shaker table, which is basically like a mini earthquake simulator. And whoever's uh, bridge could withstand it the longest before it collapsed would be the winner. So those, those I remember those stand out to me even a decade after you know I got out of school. So something like that, or just in general, because this is, <laughs> Yeah, they might not be great ideas, but it's hard to think of them off the top of your head. Off the top of your head. Uh, but in general, I always, if I were a teacher, if I was guest lecturing or, or what have you, I, I think that there's a disconnect today between what kids are actually taking in, um, how they want to learn information, and how they're actually learning information. So it seems like today, from the uh, success of science YouTube channels and creators and all that kind of thing, it seems like, and the comments I get every day, it seems like kids and students and just everybody, when they're really interested by a topic, they will go outside of school and search for a video of it rather than talking to their teacher or their professor or what have you. And I get that's an ease of use thing and you don't have to go and talk to someone, I get it. But I think the best case scenario would be that the teacher or a professor or what have you is 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 satiating your curiosity so much and speaking your language so much 
that you go out and you learn more about the topic because of it rather than the other way around. So I would, I, I advise teachers to start thinking of their lesson plans more in terms of how the kids actually speak, how they are uh, ingesting information, how, how the, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I'm not saying talk down to them. I'm not saying, oh, throw a couple memes in your PowerPoint. I'm saying make, make problems and situations more applicable to their lives. This reminds me of a story, uh, XKCD, Randall Monroe. He said he, he had a breakthrough basically in his work when he went and guest lectured at MIT and the kids were super bored until he said like, okay, we're talking about you know, physics 101 and forces and stuff. How much power would Yoda have to exert to lift the X-Wing out of the swamp? And then suddenly all the kids were like really interested and, and trying to figure it out. And I think you can do sim something similar by listening to your students, paying attention to what they're actually interested in, and then maybe tailoring questions and homework and projects to something that actually gets them excited. You want homework to advance, their, uh, advance interests rather than squash them down. You don't want to walk away from a math class being like, wow, I hope I never use that again. You want it to be like, wow, what else can I do with this? What's next? Maybe last question. Last question. Last question. From Jackson Don. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> He's getting a lot of love in chat. He's in chat right now, so, yeah. Uh, from Jackson Don. I'm just a man. What are some of the immediate and long-term effects we can expect from the Australia wa severe wildfires? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I don't... <sighs> I make that sound because there's a lot of controversy around this for some reason, and I have a hand in that, which I, <laughs> I tweeted out a picture of Australia overlaid on the United States to show how big Australia is and where all the wildfires are, and it went viral, and I was picked up by like the BBC and Australian news on both sides of it saying, hey, that's kind of misleading, and hey, you did a good job for showing how big Australia is. So I don't really know where all that landed. Um, and I'm not a climate expert, so the long-term effects of something, something as catastrophic as what's happening across Australia right now, if you're in Australia and you're watching at any time, stay safe. Uh, we're all rooting for you. Um, and good luck to all the firefighters out there. Many ecosystems naturally deal with wildfires. There are amazing examples of biology, like plants and animals uh, adapting to fires, like uh, cones, uh, seed pods from trees that will only open in response to fire, or uh, animals intentionally, there's a bird that intentionally causes wildfires. It picks up pieces of fire that it finds from other wildfires and it spreads it with its, <laughs> with its talons to get uh, little animals to run out from the brush and pick them up. They're amazing. That is all based on a, a billions of years old cycle. So these things have time to adapt where you can have uh, evolution by natural selection using that as a pressure to have things change. But what's happening right now is because of climate change, because of how the planet is getting warmer and warmer and warmer, weather patterns are changing. And now things are, ha fire season has, is happening uh, sooner and for longer. And it's hap everything is happening so quickly now in, a in terms of a geologic timescale. It's happening so dang quick that nothing is gonna really have a chance to evolve and uh, deal with this effectively. So right now, the long-term effects of something like in Australia, I can, I don't know the specifics, but I know what is going to happen is it's it's not going to just naturally bounce back and be totally fine. This is this is not part of the trend. This is not the norm. It is not good. Uh, natural ecosystems take a long time to uh, to shift and adapt to different conditions. We're not giving it enough time because of our actions. So uh, the long term effects. I mean, it's going, there, there are going to be more fires. There's going to be, there's going to be more drought. There's going to be more tsunamis. There's, no, oh, maybe not tsunamis. There are going to be more hurricanes, extreme weather. There's going to be more extreme weather. We see that in California, Australia, across the world. Um, so I don't know what the long-term effects are going to be, but from extrapolating what we're doing now to the climate with uh, carbon emissions and stuff like that, we have a pretty, we have a pretty good idea of the long-term effects of climate change, and it's not good. Uh, we got it. It's it's the most pressing problem of our time, and if we don't figure it out, no one's going to be here, or it's not going to be good over here if any of these if any of these dudes show up. Don't you want it to be like a cool place to inhabit if aliens show up rather than a burning hellscape? 
I think so. Thank you so, <laughs> thank you so much for watching this episode of Because Science Live. Woo! First week back, happy new year. I uh, hope you all, you all had a wonderful new year. Thank you for watching all of the Because Science episodes over the break, even though we were away. Wow, you want more Witcher stuff? I heard you. Don't worry about it. Next week, we have a new footnote where I'm actually answering your questions this time because I wasn't on break. We have a new episode. Hint, hint. There's a helmeted person in it. And we have another Because Science Live. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay safe and be nice to each other because they're, they're probably not here. And this is all we got.